everyone, and welcome again to our Martial Arts Week over at Central Texas College. We have had some amazing talent, uh, some amazing students this week, and we saved what we think is the best art for last, Taekwondo. Um, we have with us today Jake Davis, and he is with Legacy Art Martial Arts in Hawker Heights. Before we get started, I want to remind you guys that if you register for these events, uh, you can be counted in um, as one, that's one of the requirements for the library scholarship. So make sure you go to the library, you go to events, and you go ahead and register for that. Well, we're not going to take up a lot of time because Jake has been showing us some amazing moves and we're excited to see them get started. So enjoy. Jake, take it away. All right. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm just going to think I'm going to keep referring to myself as more often just because of the student base. But I'm actually going to be teaching out of our Copper's Cove location. So if you are in the Central Texas area and you're thinking, man, I don't want to drive the heights, we do have one right at the first half of Cove. So that's where you'll see a lot of today as far as what I'm doing. So. I want to give you guys a little bit of backstory of how I got into martial arts, how the martial arts has changed me, and then what we do that's a little differently than everybody else. For starters, I was a student at CTC, and while I was there, my instructor gave a presentation at the school itself, and so I thought, man, that would be super cool. I got my friend out of the house, and so we were like, let's just go try this. And the very first day, uh, my instructor went over how to kick in somebody in the ribs, and then what to do if somebody kicks you, he grabbed my leg and swept my leg out completely and I just slammed on the mat. And he leaned over and whispered, hey, did I, did I teach you how to fall yet? And I went, I'm wheezing, just, no. And he went, all right, cool, I'll teach you that. And then proceeded to throw me about nine more times, and I never looked back. <laughs> so a lot of the martial arts community, you'll see people talk about the relationship with their instructors, the relationship with their classmates. It sounds almost abusive, but I promise you, the way it works out when you're in there is a lot different. Um, so for my instructors, anyone who's studied Taekwondo or does karate and Taekwondo separately, you'll know that there are different subsets of the main category. And so our Taekwondo is based off of the Junri Taekwondo. So Grandmaster Junri moved to America in the 60s with about $10 in his pocket. So $10 in the 60s, great amount of stuff. $10 now, not that much. And he said, all right, I've only known Taekwondo. I only know how to do Taekwondo, but I want it to fit the American culture. So he rewrote everything he learned and based an entire martial art entirely off of the American culture and his appreciation for what America gave him in the 60s. So in order to get things started, I'm going to start with something that's more similar to the other styles, and I'm going to start with our form titled Joshin, which means confidence. Joshin. And so with that form, you'll see a lot of the low stances, a lot of quick shots, a lot of high kicks, a type I'm not known for. But I'm sure you guys noticed minor similarities. A little bit lower stances, a little bit faster on the kicks, slower on the punches. It all fits together like that. So I'm gonna get a flutter. <laughs> One of the few downsides of low stances is that you don't realize how tired you get. 
So that is what we would consider an advanced thought form. And we go through those senses. They start off learning blocks, learning kicks, and all of our curriculum is geared to be cumulative. Our black belt test consists of one mile run, two minute push up, two minute sips, all for a break, a written test, and then the real work begins. You go through every technique, every combination set, every count balance kick, every form, and then you spar three rounds, one minute continuously, and you're allowed three mistakes. So by the time you get to a black belt, you have gone good at everything. Now I'm going to be bouncing all over the place. So if you have questions, that's fine. I did rehearse this, I promise, but I'm going to be going everywhere. So I was talking about Josh and talking about Grandmaster Junior and how he wanted to make things different. And one of the things he talked about most heavily was that uh, the, the form of art, it can be broken down to something as simple as beautiful lines and colorful sounds. So a lot of what he'll do is when he wrote forms, he wrote some of them that followed along with music, but like not to the way that you'll see a lot of the more extreme people do. They'll have a song in the background and they'll move and it'll be cool. Legitimately, as he did a lot of his stuff, they followed along with beat per beat what the music was playing as. I'm not going to go just yet. I'm going to drill on that, but uh, as he went further, he wanted to create a form. And so when a lot of times when you hear other martial arts, you'll use the term martial ballet. You will be able to combine martial arts techniques with the synchronicity and music of ballet. And so, yeah, we're like, all right, cool, but I kick things. I promise you, it is way more difficult than anything I've done in the martial arts world. I don't get to choose how fast I go. It is chosen for me, and it is a much different beast. <laughs> so I am going to go ahead and go into our Star Spring of Banner, which is our uh, advanced belt musical form. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off my background noise uh, silencer so you guys can hear me perform to the Star Spangled Banner. It's uh, Cycle C Advanced. Sorry. All right, I'm gonna do a sound check to make sure that everybody can hear this. Just uh, I've got Miss uh, Cindy on there. There's just a thumbs up if you can hear it. Maybe. Welcome, ladies, This is Mr. Ham. Mr. Ham, he would actually move the to the Shaw Spang of the Bank. Perfect. Let's go ahead and restart that. I'll be just throwing the sign. To the Shaw Spang of the Bank. And so as you can see, very patriotic. It was written all in the 60s and early 70s. So as it goes on, you'll hear uh, Stars and Specs forever. 
you're here, God bless America. And then as it goes on, he wrote a poem that you'll hear is Exodus by Henry Machiavelli. So it has a lot of very American ties. And so you'll see it as more commonly American type window. Just want to give a shout out. We are a little different. You'll see that some of the stuff we do is slightly different based on school, but junior taekwondo to the core. Now, as I've been teaching at Harker Heights, my boss decided he wanted to do something that was unlike anything else that he'd seen, unlike anything else he'd done. My boss started taekwondo when he was five, very old Korean drill instructor guy, just sit there low, one, two, three, every day, no, no praise. You were only told when you were wrong and I would fix it. And so he said, you know what, that's great. That makes awesome martial artists if we're born to be that. I want amazing martial artists that I've molded, that even people that would have given up won't. So he decided he's going to do something a little different and something that a lot of martial artists in, in the world have decided to do and move to. He started something that would bring us in close to other martial arts schools and look at character development with martial arts as our vehicle. So, and we start with for the younger kids, our biggest age group is going to be the five to nine and 10 to 14 year olds. That's not saying we don't have an adult class. I like to think I did pretty good. I came out and started as an adult, but we start five, nine, 10, 14. And our number one goal is to inspire people to reach their highest potential. Start from where you want to be and push past that. And we do that with something as simple as having a word of the month that we use to talk about and we gear our folks to the drills to something similar to that. Ironically, number one we look at is discipline. And so our, our search will say a word like that have the definition and they work towards the same thing. And so with this character development in the back of their mind of all times, we can do stuff like teach discipline, teach confidence, teach integrity, teach focus. And martial arts is our way of doing that. So our martial arts definitely doesn't take a back seat. The character development does, but it's always there. And so we use that when we build everything. As we go through, we go through the ranks, we we'll start looking at stuff that's a little bit bigger. Start looking at tournaments, start looking at sparring drills. And we realize, all right, cool. I may not be able to do that, but because of the way this is geared up, it's embedded deep inside you that no matter what motivation you find, no matter what drove you in the first place, there will always be another motivation, always be another inspiration. Whether it's another instructor that believes in you and they make you feel that way, or it's another classmate that told you good job, or if it's mom and dad, we put all those together, and so that's a constant stream of praise for someone who's definitely going to be needing it. After COVID first hit, a lot of martial arts schools in the area took a big hit and couldn't have in-person classes, and martial arts was an in-person learning thing. And so one of the things we did to not only make these people that had given so much faith and had so much tied into us some sustenance back without breaking the regulations of the state of Texas, we started doing Zoom calls and we started doing a three camera breakdown of how we would do everything. So we would start off like this is, I would go over a form with it this way, and then we'd have another camera to the side. So I'd be this way, and then I have another camera behind me. So you could see all angles and we would go through step by step and have mom or dad filming and we would review that. So our normal staff of five instructors, nobody lost their job. Nobody was out of work and we all had something to do. And so with that, Although we're super thankful for it, that's my dream job. I get to do this every day. We also got to give back. And people that needed something like this, we were able to do it. Now, a lot of people ask, what's the difference between Taekwondo and Karate? Is there really a difference? And I'll go over that. Yes, Karate has some punches, it's got some kicks. Taekwondo has some punches, has some kicks. Biggest difference, Taekwondo's kicks are a little cooler. And we'll go over stuff like that. So we're, we'll make it bigger and we'll go over it. But without anything big in the way, I want to go over some of our kick styles and what that means to spar in the Taekwondo world. I'm sure we've all seen UFC. We think it's cool to do big kicks. And you're like, oh, that's unrealistic. It's never going to work. For our system, we have do something called point sparring. Sparring for points. So we have foot gear, hand gear, and head gear. And I'm going to go ahead and grab mine so you can see what that looks like. Traditionally, I'm not sponsored by Century, but man, I'm hoping to be. We have foot gear that covers the top of our foot and the heel. Can gear, pretty similar to boxing gloves. And then head gear. 
covers the sides and the top of our head a little bit. As you guys are looking at this, this isn't a lot of foam, this isn't a lot of pad. And so when you see people get knocked out in tournaments, that can happen. That absolutely can. But a lot of the things that we look at is not sparring for force, sparring for speed. So you want to be faster than your buddies to be able to hit them and move out of the way before they've hit you. And if you were looking at being out of the way, not going to go as fast. So I'm going to go ahead and grab one of our bags out and look at three of our drills that we do that boost speed, boost creativity, but more importantly, they look pretty cool. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and use my right foot. I like my right foot a lot. So I'm going to talk about something we use called a jumping jack kick. You'll see a lot of times MMA guys will be here. They have a great guard. They're ready. Their feet are moved, but they're stuck in the ground. They're not moving. So to help build and break that habit, we do jumping jacks together, apart, together, apart. We'll keep our hands close, but a little bit lower. So the back hand's higher, front hand's lower, and jumping jack. And what we'll do now is occasionally, whether your feet are together or apart, kick. As you're used to your feet moving, it's easier to kick. We bring up our foot, hit fast. And so I can do this, I can spar like this, I can move, and that explains the bounce that we do. Together, apart, together, apart, together. So that's one thing we'll work on as a speed drill. As you do this more, it'll build up, it'll be faster. Of course, the first couple of times, just like mine, I would go through this, all right, all right, together, and then apart, then together, and then apart, and then bring my foot up. All right, I got one, and it's gonna take like that. The thing that I hear a lot, especially with adults, is I'm too old to do that. I, I don't know if I can do that. I don't think my body is limber. Every martial art, Every path you take is a journey. And it's gonna be separate. It's gonna be different. If you took identical twins and you put them in martial arts, they would still have vastly different skills. And there's nothing to say about the teacher, nothing to say about anything but their personal motivations. Right now, our oldest student is 68 years old. And not only has she made it through everything, she's actually the grandmother to our Mr. Mike of Copper's Cove. She's also a candidate for a black belt. She has done it. She's put in the work. Nothing was given to her. She earned it. She may not be kicking super high. Granted, she's not super tall to begin with, but she is still making it. And it is right and it's correct. So although I'm not expecting kicks like this, as long as she shows me the clear chamber kick and recoil of every kick, she's doing it right. And that is her journey. So if you're looking to try it out, I hear that my favorite one all the time. I go to the gym occasionally, I'll see some guys that watch me work in the bag and I'm like, man, I could never do stuff like that, I'm too heavy. I think you can, I think you're, you're giving up on yourself early. So as we do stuff like this, we just remember, although I'm pretty good at it, I teach every day, I practice every day, and I've earned my second degree black belt, I ought to be pretty good at it. If I wasn't, that'd be a bigger problem. So, we look at the speed drill now because we can't have that power, but we want to make sure that, that power is used correctly. So a lot of people, especially karate guys, have a side kick where it goes straight from the side, pushes straight out, comes back. This kick right here, it is really good. It's really versatile, but people either use it with speed that it doesn't have any power or they use it with so much power it doesn't have any speed. And so Taekwondo is looking at using that as our medium. When you kick like that, your body is fully separate. So all of the points that people are looking at are over you, and they're on the other end of the foot. So we do something that we call a viper side kick. So I'm going to move this slightly over. Normally, if you're doing this traditionally, you would step, cross your foot behind so your hips can turn, and pull back. Side kick. A lot of power, a lot of speed. But if you were spying somebody and you saw them go, all right, cool. You know what's coming. You know what's going to be there. And so in order to beat that, we started looking at a drill where we would pick up our foot and jump to slide in. I would miss now, but if I move in, I shoot and kick at the same time. My movement and my kick happen at once. If anybody is a fan of Mortal Kombat, you'll see Johnny Cage does this a lot. Granted, I don't slide that far. It is still based off of the Taekwondo Viper sidekick. Even further, I can pick it up move and get that distance. Still have that force, still have that speed, but I also have the choice of moving distance and switching that up. 
So with that, we have a lot of differences. I have had the pleasure of sparring with some sport karate schools. And so I've seen the way they spar and I have nothing bad to say about it, but always, always, always with karate schools, their hands are super fast and their legs don't kick very high. <laughs> so one of the things we talk about with sparring is there's a bunch of things. You wanna look at your footwork. You wanna look at your hands. You wanna look at your feet. You wanna look at your head movement. But flexibility is the least worked on piece of anybody sparring. And you'll see people in the UFC that just have shoulders for days or flexibility in their legs for days that hardly ever tap out because they're already so flexible, they have nothing to worry about. So if you're using Taekwondo to transfer out, you have a bunch of those spaces that we're going to relate. Point sparring is going to work a little differently. Don't get really good at point sparring, go straight to the UFC. It's a much different beast. You're going to have a much different story. But we want to talk with that, they translate over as far as ideals, mindset, and movement. So I've said a lot about point sparring. I've talked about point sparring. And a lot of you might out there might still be wondering, what the heck is even point sparring? So I'm going to break it down, starting with the concept, the point system, the time limit, and then how to prove the better or worse on that. So with us, starters, we have our foot gear, we have our hand gear, and we have our helmet. Our hand gear counts as one point. If you punch, back fist, or chop, rich hand, whatever you do, hand techniques are worth one point. If you kick, whether it's round, side, front, crescent, I miss one, hook, whichever one you're doing, those all count as two points. And so you're looking at making contact with the chest, the stomach, the ribs, and the side of the head gear. And if you're a black belt, the face. A lot of tournament places will not let underbelts, but basically a uh, white, gold, orange, green, whatever, they won't let them hit to the face because they don't want to spark um, rage in the comp. They want to have a lot of control for that. So with that, as you're looking, all right, cool. And you have two guys in the ring. They put their hands up. They're looking at each other. They're covering different spots and moving, but they have to cover their chest, stomach, ribs, and the side of their head. Unfortunately, a common practice for people to do the UFC stance. Here, their face is covered. The top chest is covered, but all of this spot is wide open. So you'll see a bunch of the, the top two athletes, they'll spot with their hands completely down with that front hand as a shield. I'm not that good. I don't claim to be that good. So let's look at the middle ground, which is what I do. I'll have my front hand down as a shield and my back hand almost in front of me towards the shield for my face and upper section. This is what a lot of the guys that are at least decent will start looking at. I'm not going to come here every now and then. That's not saying I won't try to mess with somebody and come here. A lot of it is going to be a chess game, looking at what they're going to use. Now, if you, as you first get started, speed is going to matter most. Speed is going to be number one. Flexibility is going to be number two. That way you can hit here and here, because if you can't hit here, the other person is going to block their head, only got to block the chest. And then the third one we're looking at is setting up. So that looks what comes for a third uh, drill. I'm just going to do another one after this, but... We're going to look at, as we do our jumping jack kicks, we're going to start doing the same thing. Round, I come in, round, I come in again. And this time, because whoever I'd be sparring would be thinking, oh, another round is coming, I'll do something different. So, round, round, hook. And now I hit a completely different side. And so as they respond, all right, cool, round, I got it. Round, I got it. And then they put their hands right here again, thinking another round's coming. And the hook it hits over the other side. So we can look at different sparring techniques. And of course, people in the UFC, you'll see this all the time. Absolutely love a guy in this UFC named Israel Adesanya. Learns from Mr. Kicks from Taekwondo. Absolutely beast in the ring. I would not want to fight him, but I know that his kicks are fantastic. And one of the things he'll do is he'll set up something low. He'll like to use that back leg, kick really low, aim their thigh. They get used to it. He goes one, two round, one, two round. And they go, all right, cool. By the third or fourth time he does that, he does something different. One, two, uppercut. So they already dropped their weight. They moved their foot to catch the kick. Everything's open. It's called a setup. You'll see that in sparring. You'll see that in UFC. You'll see that in karate point sparring. You'll see that everywhere because it's a chess game. And it's awesome and it's super fun. And I absolutely love working with it. So we have our sparring down. I've gone over how our traditional forms are a little different than everybody else's. But one of the reasons that a lot of people get started is they see something cool on TV and they want to try it out and learn how to actually do that. So for me, it's Power Rangers. I grew up 
Power Rangers was the coolest thing on the planet, and I want to do everything like that. My boss is a little older. He saw Bruce Lee movies in theaters. <laughs> a lot of our younger kids nowadays, they see Cobra Kai, or they see the original Karate Kid and want to do some of that stuff. So let's look at some of the stuff that they do that's different and how that's expanded throughout the years. Like I said, the martial arts kicks, they have a use. I will use what's commonly referred to as a tornado or a spinning crescent, a cute, and I can still hit somebody with that because I know the setup on that. I can use that and build up, but a lot of people, they take their martial art in a different direction, performance. Sparring is guaranteed. You have to spar in a martial art, otherwise you can't know if it works. But that doesn't mean that's the only thing you have to do. As I started, I showed you the forms that we use, and that's a different branch of performance. And I'll show you something a little bit higher stream, a little bit more fun. That's something that the martial arts community has called tricking, taking the martial arts skills, some gymnastic skills, and making a cross between them. So as you saw that 360 turning kick, crescent, or a tornado, I look over my shoulder, I bring one knee up, jump, switch, and kick with that one. That is one of our foundational pieces because although it's difficult to start, it is used all the time. And the concept of that is used even more for something that we call a, five, a cheap 540 kick. I'm gonna step over, jump off my right leg, kick with my right leg, and land on my right leg, thus making a 540 degree turn after the step. So, tornado kick, 540, Land on the right. And as we build that up, it, it looks cool. It has a lot of power and it, it builds up your flexibility and your air awareness. That's not the only thing we'll do. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen Cobra Kai. We'll talk about sweeps as you move in, taking out someone's legs without a target there the first time. Building up prowess on that. But now for some of the more gymnastic side of things. A lot of things we'll do will combine these. So one of the first things I want to talk about is what we call a, a transformer. It also has other names, depending on who you ask. I run this as nicknamed the transformer. It's going to be a spinning handstand used to jump and spin. So I'm going to go over just the setup. And now I can spin in my handstand. I can look cool. If you're thinking, how can I use that in martial arts? If you guys look at the legacy page, there's a video of me breaking a board with that kick. It's kind of cool. It took some time. I'm going to pretend that I got it the first try. But now we look, how does that, how does that relate? I'm going to use this to help build up momentum in one area so I can jump and spin and hook kick. So I come down. I can jump up, spin, get height, and that motivates my body. These transfer out. A lot of our more traditional guys, they like a big side kick. Don't worry. We never missed it. I always work on that. It's going to be a big piece of what we do. But as you build up your athletics through tricking, sparring becomes easier. Forms become easier. So they do transfer out. They all play a part of the circle. It's not one part. If someone just tricks, their sparring is going to suck. If someone just spars, their tricking is going to suck. If they focus on just one of those two, their forms suck. You have to play all parts of it. At least. If you want to be very good, you want to call yourself very good. I've known some spars that aren't as good at tricking, but their forms are great. I've known some triggers whose forms are great and their sparring sucks. I've met traditional forms competitioners who can absolutely break down a form and teach it and do it better than anybody you've ever seen. And sometimes their sparring is a little lackluster. But that's what we're going to build on. Every week, we look at a different aspect of what we're doing. So I'll focus one week on our techniques, making sure, can you do a proper front kick? Can you do a proper side kick? Can you do a proper round kick? And then the very next week, our warm up will be based on the techniques and we'll move into your self defenses. If somebody's trying to hit me, can I front kick to stop them? If somebody's trying to grab me, can I use my kicks and my movement to get out? If somebody's trying to beat me up and they have a weapon, can I run away? <laughs> No, we'll, we'll look at different stuff with that. And so your techniques play a part of your self-defense. Your self-defense plays a part of your techniques. The week after that, we'll look at your forms. All right, cool. Can I keep my power of my legs by staying low 
So I'm used to having strain on it. So when I get to hit something, I have all that built up pressure power using for something else. If you, for people who want stronger legs, they do squats. Well, it's the same motion. And instead of coming down, touching the floor, coming up and building up that power one rep at a time. All right, cool. I'll stay in my squat. I will use my hands. I'll build up what I'm used to. And I have that same workout at a much, uh, not at a much faster, but in a very different aspect. So I'm used to holding it. I'm used to that pressure. I'm used to the strain. So I can hit with the same power I would have by building it up in a stance. Plus, I like doing forms more than squats. I don't know about you guys. Me and leg day, we don't always get along. Tack windows, always leg day. <laughs> so we build those up, the forms pieces. The forms have our techniques. The forms also directly translate to a uh, choreographed fight between the performer and a bunch of opponents. As you see, especially in karate and taekwondo, the forms are based off a fight. For our very beginner foundation level, we'll start here. This is our ready stance. They look to the first target. Some guy wants to swing, punch him in the face. They block, and they hit. Look to the other side. There's another guy doing the same thing from the other side. Block, hit. And that's the fight that they had. It was a block of one punch, hit with another. Block of another punch, hit with the other hand. And so with that, you have your self-defense scenario as your forms. Not always super great. It's not always going to be transported to what people are going to do, but you have that skill. So if that does happen, maybe not the first technique, maybe not the middle technique, but if it does happen, you have an inherent know-how of what to do. And that helps build your self-defense. And then last one, which sets ours just a little bit apart from other schools, we have a balanced curriculum. Part of your test ranking from belt to belt is a certain count kick. For the early beginner level, it sounds like a three count front kick. One, two, three. Nothing ridiculous until you start looking at the intermediate count where it goes one, two, three, four, five, six. And it builds up from there. As you get better at it, as you get more used to it, you've got to learn how to balance them on one foot, but also that translates to making your techniques better, your chambers better, your speed and your head movement better. So if I throw my head down every time I kick, as soon as someone needs contact, I'm going to follow it. I've got to keep my posture tall. That way, everything I do transfers back to the middle. So we set that up, we move on. And like I said, it is all transferred out. They all relate to each other. And the same way you'll see it when you think, people think, oh, Taekwondo is not very practical. When we're showing off, probably not. But when we get to use it, we do we sit down to our basics. We have such a higher skill level required for the big ones that our basics grow with it. If I'm used to jumping and spinning twice and then throwing a side kick, well, then my basic side kick is going to be pretty good. If I'm used to jumping off one leg, kicking with landing on it, then my independence for one leg is going to be really good. So I can strip down my basics when I need it in a self-defense scenario and then push my limits as a performer and as a martial artist to look for the higher and crazier movements and build more awareness for my body. So it is, like I said, a full circle. And that's what explains our logo. Our logo has a guy doing a jump side kick and a circle and that represents the legacy that we do. A lot of what we do is a family motivated piece. Right now, our oldest uh, student who is 68, her grandson owns the Coppers Cove School. His little brother takes classes. His mom takes classes. It is a family ordeal. And so we build those pieces together. So yeah, sometimes dad's working on something and kids working on another, but they're still gonna be able to work together whether or not the same bank, uh, same rank or something different because we work those drills together. The foundation builds up, but they transfer out. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is everybody's favorite thing, but a lot of the more traditional martial artists, bane of existence, something that we like to call XMA or extreme martial arts. This was, in fact, invented by the Blue Power Ranger in my chat. So I already have a, I have a bias. It's pretty clear. But uh, as we look on, this is what you're going to see in movies. This is what you're going to see as performances for people with weapons. They're going to be crazy and off the wall and think, all right, cool, I, they might not be able to break it over my head in a street fight, but God, they could hit me a thousand times. And that's what I wanted to look at today. I'm going to start with two of my forms, but I'm going to use my bow staff first. This is everybody's first weapon that they think of when they think martial arts weapon. 
Donatello or uh, any of the Ninja Turtles, everyone always remembers Nebosa. It's pretty cool. It's pretty movement, and it, it makes the show. Especially as you'll see, mine is very flashy for that reason. Although I'm not moving that fast, man, it looks like it. It's kind of cool, and that's what makes this thing. We, as we do, we look at progress, and cool things make us feel better. So I'm going to start with one of our earlier level uh, forms that we use in our group at school called the Black Hope Club that help learn weapons and more of the tricking stuff at a higher rate. Let's start with our bow staff form. And so we're starting off, it's fast, it's simple, but teaching kids fast and simple is exactly what you need. <laughs> now it's not saying I have adults right now. I have 15 adults that are in the black belt. They look at the forms. Right now, only one of them is a black belt. So you, they, they just had to go through the ranks the same way. It's fun. It's cool, it builds up, but also more importantly, it builds muscle control. A lot of people will look to this with a Bruce Lee skit. And one of Bruce Lee's favorite things was to get ready, punch, touch your lip and pull it back before somebody even brought their hands up. Now, if you've ever tried this, you probably punched your friend in the face and that's not a good thing. They didn't laugh, they didn't like it. So we look at our awareness, body awareness, muscle control. So when we do stuff like this, I've got 20 to 30 kids on my floor. And they've all got five foot or six foot bow staffs. If they don't know their range, they're gonna hit the buddy in the back of the head. And then I get in trouble, they get in trouble, mom and dad get mad. So we look at our awareness and our muscle control. If you overshoot, you hit your buddy. So we start off slow. We get used to the motion, but we get used to using our own body to stop the bow staff. How to have control to stop our movement. And that's gonna do the same thing when they spar. If they're sparring somebody and their buddy trips and they think, oh, this is my chance. And they realize that everybody's on the floor, they have to be able to stop. If somebody is a judge or they're at school even, and somebody's trying to hurt them, they put their hands up and then they're, all right, this is my chance. I'm gonna knock this guy out. And then the teacher walks in. Maybe I won't knock this guy out. And that's a kind of muscle control that will help build up an awareness of themselves. They'll, you look at different pieces, they'll be able to control their body more and have a better understanding how things work. I'm a career martial artist. I want to do this for the rest of my life. And as long as I have such an outstanding support group from the families that I teach, I will. That being said, not every student I teach is going to do that. And so having this muscle control is going to translate to basketball. Can I move my hands in a way that I can control the ball? To travel to football, can I catch? Can I move? Can I have the awareness to move my body? It's going to transfer to any other sport as they need to use. Even wrestling. I have one of my students now is in high school. He wrestles in high school, comes to take Taekwondo at night. And he's talking about how one of the drills they're looking at is using their legs, using their core. Well, Taekwondo is about entirely legs and core. So as they get stronger stomach muscles, stronger leg muscles, they're going to translate. And I'm going to keep using this motion. I got stuck on this motion, so I'm going to keep there. But... <laughs> They, they, they transfer out. As you do sports in school, martial arts it doesn't have an on or off season. You'll, you'll find a tournament in the winter, you'll find a tournament in the summer, find a tournament in spring or fall, and you don't have to go. Not for us. I'm focused on making my students better. I still go to tournaments. I still make the time for that, but that's me, and that's my journey. And so that's what they're all going to transfer out there. Now, I talked more about something that we use and combining the traditional martial arts weapons with the XMA, making it look cool, making it fun to watch, but also building up that power and that control. So without further ado, I'm gonna bring out uh, my pride and joy, my sword. Same thing that we're gonna use. We're gonna go over what would be used for a master's club, our advanced belt uh, black book club, and talk about their weapons form that is much more advanced, much more difficult, 
requires much more control. So as you'll see, a lot of practice goes into that. A lot of what we do requires a lot of practice and a lot of breakdown. So one of the things we look at primarily is the lesson plan. If you've ever taught anything before, you know you got to have a plan going in. And so one of the things we do as a staff is we look at what they're required to know at the end of the cycle and how we break that down week by week so we can consistently learn and build on each other. And forms are going to be no different. If you've ever done this much before, you know, all right, before I learned all of my form, I learned a section. Weapons forms are no different. Traditional forms are no different. If you guys dance, you learn part of a routine. You learn part at a time. And that's going to transfer the same way. Now, Sword is going to be one of my favorites because it is the most difficult to do right. If your hand is slightly turned, instead of cutting through the air like it's supposed to, it'll sound like you're swinging like a fly swatter. So have the quick and clean nice, and it's awesome. I love that sound, but it's difficult. The big thing that sword that a lot of people miss is that it is a two-handed weapon. As you push with one hand, you have to pull with the other. Every single strike no matter where it comes from and it helps use about how one body body will try to help the other so if you're looking at sparring a lot of things you'll see especially from point spars and high level competitors something we call a reverse kick or a spinning kick after they kick with one they will switch and kick with the other and at first you watch think, all right cool i just have to turn and look and while that might be true your speed will suffer for it. So what we look at now is using the same motion with the sword, pull one, push the other to help create that power. Same thing with the leg that's coming back in. After I've kicked, I'm not just gonna let my leg fall, I'm going to pull it down, helping my body spin, helping it transfer, helping it move together. One part helps the other. And so a lot of these things you'll see, especially as you go through a long time, you might think, oh, that's great, I never thought of that. I've been doing that, I thought of it. And so that's what, especially with the staff we put together, breaking it down. Now, one of the great parts about our school that I think is unheard of is we actually go and get training on how to be an instructor, not just how to do the, know the curriculum, but how to teach, how to be the inspiration for someone else. And one of the things that is the most beneficial for that is I went and got my degree in child psychology. I have a bachelor's in child psychology, so that helps transfer out to lifestyle, but that's not the only one. My coworker, Mr. Nick, has a degree in fitness and dietary, so he knows how to help people create a fitness goal. He knows how to help people create a, a workout plan and how to work with people who have uh, injuries and how to work with people who have uh, certain muscle strength. So yeah, he can take the fit into the god status where they look like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, or he can take the mom that had two kids and was out of work for COVID and help her back to the way that she felt comfortable in. And we work with that for parents, for kids. I have three students that have Down syndrome, and they're not going to be given the easy route. They're going to do everything, but I know how to work with them. I know how to talk to them. I know how to get them 
to understand something that previously would have been difficult if possible to do. I have no shortage of students with autism, and I can not only help them understand, but I can help the students around them understand. And they can have friends, and they can do the same sport. They can have a good time without feeling like they need to have a good time with other people like them. They can meet new people. They can have new understandings. And ironically, that's what that was. That's my alarm to go ahead and get ready for work because I have to go to work tonight and then drive to Dallas to get more training on that this weekend. So with that, I'm going to open it up to the floor. Does anybody have any questions for me or about my school? I don't, see any, I don't see any questions right now, but a Tony Clay said, I want to do it. <laughs> so you got some people <laughs> excited. Well, Tony, I'm Mr. Jake. Your first adult class is free just to try out and make sure you like it, make sure you have fun. So if you have a Tuesday, Thursday, or Friday night at 730 available, our address is in Harker Heights. <laughs> yeah, and we put his website in the comments. Um, I'm. I have more of a comment than a question. How yeah. can you possibly talk while you're <laughs> doing all this high level energy? This tells me that this is an extreme workout, martial arts. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit more sweaty than I initially anticipated, but uh, one of the things we do is uh, we talk about a teaching circle. And so in order to teach a student what I want them to know, they have to know what it looks like. So number one, go out and perform it the absolute best you can do in front of the class. Then you walk them through it step by step, go faster step by step, let them move so you can watch it correct, and do it again. And so I do that six classes a day, every day a week, two or three times a class. And at first, I went home and just sat down on my couch and just passed out. And it was it's such more, way more work than I initially anticipated. But I got better at it now. And so considering I've been doing this for the last three years as a head instructor and now currently chief instructor of Legacy Martial Arts, um, I'm better at it. As you could tell, I still had to take slow gas, get water, but I, I am able to do it better now. And I don't want anyone to go in thinking, sure, I can do this. Like I wasn't even tired. I'm tired, guys. Uh, you can't see my undershirt, but I'm sweaty. <laughs> well, I, I do have a question. With your very little ones, the ones who get started, um, I mean, you're not teaching them to kick right away, are you? What, what do you teach those little bitty ones when they first start? So um, I, that's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that in two parts. <laughs> so we do have a, a – oh, my goodness, I'm going to be choking wrong. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we have two programs for our littler kids. For kids that are three and four years old, we have something called our Tiny Tigers program. And they're going to learn how to do jumping jacks, how to catch the ball, how to listen and focus the man. So it looks like a lot of games, but all of these games are designed to put a part in the head thinking, all right, I have to stop when he says this. I have to listen when he says this. I have to move my arms like this. I have to move my hand like this. So I will teach them how to punch, but they won't punch each other. For my kids, we break it down piece by piece. So um, I'll start with, all right, guys, let's look at this. First things first, before we do anything, raise your right hand. I promise not to use my super cool martial arts on my friends, my classmates, my family, or my furniture. So that way they have to use this and understand with that background, I'm not hitting anybody at all. And so as you go through the beginner side, that's nine months about minimum, as they go from white belt to our gold belt, then they can start looking at sparring, but they've gone through Nine months, all right, I don't kick friends. I don't kick the couch. I don't kick mom. I don't kick uh, miss whatever at school. And so that builds in, they grow from there. Once you have to control the start, then you can pull back a little bit to be able to hit your buddy. And then another thing I'll use is called chicken sparring. So as they get used to trying to hit each other, a lot of people will start wailing super big, heavy kicks, and they'll hurt their buddy. And I don't want that. So what I do is they have to spar with one leg up. The leg that's up has to do everything. And so they can't... Yeah generate a bone breaking amount of force with the leg with the leg up so that's how we take little kids and move them off <laughs> that's cool that's cool well i know that you have to leave and you have to go do all your classes and um you're expected to continue on doing it for the weekend 
<laughs> so we're we're going to let you go, but I just want to thank you so much for taking the time today to visit with us, show us your studio, show us your moves. Uh, Taekwondo, before we started, we were talking about that, um, that Taekwondo group on America's Got Talent. So if you haven't had a chance to see Taekwondo, hi, hi, hi. Make sure you I watch know. that. I have yeah. nothing to say for those men and women. They are way more in tune and doing this in a lot longer. I want to thank you guys so much for bringing this out. This means that I'm doing something right as an instructor and as a martial artist. So I really appreciate this gift to be able to give back and talk about it. Thank you guys so much. Awesome. Awesome. Well, and before we go, guys, um, I we were wrapping up our martial arts we, week. We had some amazing talent, amazing uh, studios in our area. So if you're into martial arts, we showed you three different types of martial arts and, um, you know, check them out and, and see what's going on in your community. Now, remember. We've got more stuff going on next week. Monday, we have our CTC uh, astronomer, Warren Hart. He's got another night sky tour. And on Wednesday, we're going to reveal our winners for our talent contest. We we had some amazing talent that entered. So um, make sure you check with us back on Monday and you check with us back on Wednesday. Everybody, you guys have an awesome weekend. Jake, you have an awesome weekend. Thank you, Lee. Have an awesome weekend, and we will see you later. So, everybody, have a good day. Jake, don't go anywhere yet. <laughs> All right, Lee, oh, yeah. take us out.